Well, I was uh, once watching a rerun of the quiz program, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And I'm not quite sure to what stage the contestant had got, but the question was, in which gospel does Jesus tell the parable of the Good Samaritan? And uh, as you will know if you watch the programme, there are always four possible answers, which is handy because there are four Gospels. Is it in Matthew, Mark, Luke or John? And the contestant didn't know the answer, so he used his phone a friend lifeline. And in the meantime, we're screaming at the television that I knew the answer. <laughs> But fortunately for the contestant, his phone a friend did know the answer, and without hesitation he said, Luke's Gospel. And that's our cue now to look this morning at what is likely to be the most well-known parable that Jesus ever told. There is today widespread biblical ignorance. Parents for a number of generations now have not sent their children to Sunday school. These days, Christianity is only one of a number of religions which is taught in our schools. Therefore, with a declining number of people attending church and far fewer children being taught the Christian faith, the vast majority of people don't even know the most famous parts of the Bible. However, Everyone knows what is meant by a good Samaritan and by the expression which Karen read to us to pass by on the other side. So this Sunday, although we've come to one of the most uh, well-known stories in the Bible, I suspect, like some of the other parables Jesus told, it is actually widely misunderstood. Like the, the sheep and the goats that we looked at last week from Matthew's Gospel, some commentators have questioned whether the parable of the Good Samaritan should even be called a parable in the first place. For instance, the, the story is not an allegory. What Jesus describes could well be based on real life events or certainly on what was likely to happen on the road down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was, in Jesus' time, a dangerous journey to make on your own. And people did often get assaulted and robbed on that treacherous stretch of road. But again, for simplicity's sake, like in the case of the sheep and the goats, I will refer to the parable of the Good Samaritan as everybody thinks of the story in these terms. And like in the other parables, there is a shock in the story. There is something to make Jesus' listeners' ears prick up. There is something they're not expecting Jesus to say and makes them gasp when he does. And this is found, if you've got your Bibles open, in verse 33. The first three words. But a Samaritan, but a Samaritan. And that's our sermon title for this morning, <laughs> but a Samaritan. Now, of course, uh, we cannot read the parable and not be touched by the strong morality of the story. But I don't believe Jesus' purpose was so much to urge his questioner to do his moral duty as it was to expose his moral bankruptcy. In this man's eyes, he was righteous, but in Jesus' eyes, he was self-righteous, and self-righteousness does not count for anything in the kingdom of God. So I believe the message of Jesus' parable is not so much to do with works of mercy, but with the imperative of mission. The point of the parable is not primarily ethical, but evangelistic. Jesus is dealing with a highly religious man who is in serious need of divine grace. And I'd like us to look at the story, the parable, under four headings this morning. 
Firstly, from verse 29, we should consider the lawyer who sought to justify himself. There's an old story of a religious skeptic once engaging with Martin Luther in debate. And the skeptic asked Luther, what was God doing before he made the world? And the lawyer, uh, and Luther is uh, reputed to have sardonically replied, making hell for people who ask stupid questions like that. And this lawyer, not a lawyer as we would understand him to be in legal terms, but an expert in the law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, a religious lawyer, therefore, he too asks a skeptic's question. Teacher, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he asks the question not to be informed because he already knows the answer. No, he asks the question in order to see what uh, Jesus would make of the answer. He asks the question to test Jesus' religious credentials. Would Jesus answer the question as an Orthodox Jew? Or would he set off some religious firecrackers? Would he say something indiscreet and thereby discredit himself? Now note that the, the, the questioner, the lawyer, is respectful. He addresses Jesus' as teacher. But there is a large dose of scepticism behind the question. And thoughts like this were in his mind. How can this self-appointed rabbi from the backwaters of Nazareth be so sure of himself? I'll test him and see how he responds under pressure. But Jesus deftly deflects the lawyer's question back to him and he asks him what he makes of his own question. The lawyer gives a textbook answer. He recites the Jewish confession of faith known as the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And because love for God is difficult to detect, you demonstrate your love for God by your love for people. So that the lawyer rightly goes on to recite Leviticus 19 verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus affirms the lawyer's answer and says, that's exactly it. Do these things. Love God with all your being and your neighbor as yourself, and you will inherit eternal life. But the lawyer believes he's come off second best in his dialogue with Jesus. Jesus hadn't rebuked him, but had effectively said to him, you don't need me to answer questions you already know the answer to. If you aspire to eternal life by the root of the law, that's the way you need to go about it. If you don't want me to justify you, you will have to justify yourself by perfectly obeying the Shema and the practical application of the Shema by loving your neighbor as yourself. And that's exactly what the lawyer wanted to do. He wanted to justify himself. He wanted to justify himself in two ways. He wanted to justify himself in his dialogue with Jesus. He didn't want Jesus to let Jesus have the last word. Jesus had adroitly made him answer his own question. Jesus had shot his fox. Jesus had said effectively, I can see the game you're playing and I'm not playing it. But the lawyer does not follow that old adage that if you're digging yourself into a hole, the first thing you should do is stop digging. No, he thinks he can get the better of Jesus. So he comes up with a follow-up question, verse 29. And who exactly is my neighbor? This question, along with the first he asked, shows that secondly, he believed he could 
justify himself before God. Look how he phrases the question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer had a works righteousness religion. He thought it was within his powers to inherit eternal life. It meant a strict observance of the law to demonstrate his reverence for God. But by his second question, he was trying to make the high standard of loving one's neighbor as oneself more manageable by narrowly defining who his neighbor was. By asking, and who is my neighbor, the lawyer is asking, where do you draw the line, Jesus? You can't seriously mean everyone is my neighbor. My neighbor can only really be respectable people like me. Or at the very most, my neighbor is a Jew like me. So that's the lawyer. He's trying to justify himself. Firstly, in his verbal jousting with Jesus. And secondly, in his good works based religion. Well, the lawyer's follow-up question then causes Jesus to tell, secondly, the story with an unexpected twist. Now, as soon as Jesus began the story, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. His audience instinctively knew that this was likely to be a journey that would end badly. The 17-mile road between Jerusalem and Jericho was a notoriously hazardous one. There were lots of places for bandits to hide and then ambush unsuspecting travelers. And this is exactly what happens in Jesus' story. Robbers, without a compassionate bone in their bodies, see the traveler afar off, they see that he's on his own, and they see him as easy prey. They set upon him mercilessly they strip him they beat him they make their getaway and they leave him hovering between life and death they act like animals and treat him as if he were an animal and not a human being now we know nothing about the, this traveler we can only assume that he's a jew we could say that he only had himself to blame for making such a dangerous journey on his own in the first place. But he paid a, a heavy price for his lack of judgment. And unless someone intervened, he would just be another murder statistic on that perilous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. But he had hope. He had hope. Not long afterwards, the priest comes by and sees the stricken man. Surely he's the sort of man you would want to come upon you had you been beaten up and left for half dead. And the priest knows the law of God. He knows the Shema. He knows that loving God is abstract, but that loving people is concrete. He knows that loving people is the evidence God wants to see in the people who claim to worship him. But this priest knows other scriptures as well. And he knows from Numbers 19, verse 11, that to touch a corpse would render him ceremonially unclean for seven days. It would make him unfit to serve as a priest for a week. And serving as a priest was his livelihood. It was what fed and watered him. So the priest rationalizes his non-intervention. This man is not my problem. This man is not my responsibility. I'm not the cause of this man's misfortune. He's probably dead anyway. And there is too much at stake for me to get involved. He decides, therefore, to pass by on the other side as if the stricken man were not there. The next man to come by is equally religious. This time a, a Levite, the tribe of Israel from which the priests were historically appointed. And this Levite also knows his Old Testament. He too is well aware of, the, of his obligations towards his neighbor from the law of God. But he also 
rationalizes his non-intervention. Perhaps he justified it by saying to himself that it was too late to do anything. The unfortunate man was either dead or, or soon would be. Perhaps he said to himself it would be too risky. Instead of stopping and seeing if there was anything he could do for the victim, he should make haste and be on his way. The bandits could still be at large and he could be their next victim. What had happened to this unfortunate man had been the Levite's wake-up call. He shouldn't therefore loiter, he should leg it. He shouldn't dawdle, he should dash. He too then passes by on the other side. And so in the space of just two verses, Jesus dismisses what his listeners would have thought was the man's best hope for compassion. Two religious men, a priest and a Levite. But these men are examples of the goats Jesus spoke about last week in Matthew 25. I was in need, but you did nothing to help me. And of course, it's easy, isn't it? for us to condemn them both for their indifference, for their inaction, and for their lack of compassion. But we know, don't we, in our heart of hearts that we've done the same. We've seen real need, but we have not intervened to help. We've been too busy, too preoccupied, too much in a hurry, or sadly too indifferent to intervene. Perhaps we've been suffering from what they call today compassion fatigue. Our hearts have become so hardened and have been unmoved despite the clear and obvious need staring us in the face. There have been occasions then when we too have passed by on the other side. But now, verse 33, comes the twist in the tale. Now comes the character Jesus introduces into the story which shocks his listeners but a Samaritan. A leopard would be more likely to change its spots than a Samaritan help a Jew. Today, it would be like visualizing a member of a mass coming to the aid of a Zionist. It would be like a Ukrainian coming to the aid of a wounded Russian soldier. And our first reading from Karen gave us uh, the example of the antipathy between Jew and Samaritan, when James and John casually asked Jesus whether they should call down fire from heaven to destroy a Samaritan village which wouldn't welcome them. The hatred between Jews and Samaritans went back over 400 years. Their mutual loathing was based on their racial purity. The Jews had kept theirs while in their Babylonian exile, but the Samaritans had lost theirs by intermarrying with their Assyrian invaders. And to a Jew, a Samaritan then was someone who had compromised his religious heritage and had abused his racial purity. He was a mongrel. He was a half-breed. In the days of the Wild West, the cowboy would say, wouldn't, they, uh, wouldn't he, that uh, the only good Indian was a dead one. And that would have been an attitude of a Jew in Jesus' day concerning a Samaritan. But now Jesus is about to introduce into the story not a Jew as the hero, but a despised Samaritan. So what is it about this Samaritan traveler when he sees the stricken man? Well, he has compassion on him. The Greek word, shplaganisomai, it means to be moved with pity from the depths of your being. And the Samaritan sees, doesn't see a Jew, he sees a human being. He doesn't see a figure of hate, he sees someone in desperate need. He doesn't see someone to be despised, but someone to be helped. And whereas the priest and the Levite rationalize why they shouldn't get involved, the Samaritan doesn't give it a second thought. He goes over to the stricken man. He bandages his wounds. He uses oil and wine as an antiseptic. He puts the man on his own beast. 
and trans transports him to the nearest inn. He nurses him through the night and sets aside a considerable amount of money for his ongoing care. The Samaritan doesn't begin something he isn't willing to complete. He assures the innkeeper he will return and will recompense him for any additional expense the innkeeper has incurred regarding this man's treatment. In short, the Samaritan did something because he felt something. He was stirred in his heart to intervene. So the unexpected twist in the story is the man who should have been the villain, he's actually the hero. Whereas the, man who should have, whereas the men who should have been the heroes were actually the villains. You know, there's another irony here. Had the victim not been half dead and helpless, under other circumstances, he would have rejected the hated Samaritans' attempts to help him. He would have rebuffed them. Jews, you see, are a proud race, and they'd been taught not to accept works of charity from non-Jews. So we have seen the lawyer who sought to justify himself, prompting Jesus to tell this story with an unexpected twist. This brings us back to the interaction then between Jesus and the lawyer. So we have thirdly, in verses 36 and 37, the question the lawyer should have asked. Now it's interesting that, the, that Jesus doesn't actually answer the lawyer's question as to who his neighbour is. Instead, after finishing his story, Jesus asks the lawyer a question of his own. Not, who is my neighbour, but of the three men in the parable, which of them acted as a neighbour to the victim of the bandits? In other words, Jesus asks the lawyer the question the lawyer should have asked. Not minimally, who am I required to love, but proactively, to whom can I be a loving neighbour? And the lawyer's question indicated that he had a very narrow idea of whom he had neighbourly obligations towards. And Jesus' question indicated his idea of neighbourliness had no boundaries. A neighbour to Jesus is to be the channel of compassion to the person in need, whoever they are. And what is more, a neighbour is no, not so much the beneficiary as the benefactor. A true neighbour is the giver and not the receiver of deeds of kindness. Look again at verse 36, this time from the English Standard Version. Which of the three do you think proved to be a neighbour to the man who fell among the robbers? For us, in modern day English, the word neighbour is passive, isn't it? It merely describes someone who lives next door to us or near to us. And in our internet age, we might well have more contact with people who live miles away from us through social media than we have with people who live just a few yards away from us in our own roads. And we see good neighbourliness in terms of the absence of Negatives. Our neighbours don't play loud music. They don't bother us. They keep themselves to themselves. They return what they borrow. But for Jesus, to be a neighbour is to be proactive. You don't wait to be asked, but you take the initiative in responding to the need of another like the Samaritan did. To act as a neighbour is to see someone in need and to do what you can in response to that need. Now it's interesting that when the lawyer asks, answers Jesus' question in verse 36, he still can't bring himself to say the word Samaritan in reply. He's still so shocked that it is the Samaritan who is the hero in the story, he can't bring himself to reply, it was the Samaritan, but simply says, the one who had mercy on him, verse 37. 
So we have the, the, the neighbour, the, 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 the lawyer who sought to justify himself, the story with an unexpected twist, the, the question the lawyer should have asked, and then finally, verse 37b, the conclusion the lawyer should have reached. Jesus told him, go and do Luke likewise. And with these words, Luke finishes his account of Jesus' encounter with the lawyer. And Jesus was saying this to him effectively. <coughs> Loving your neighbour as yourself is doing what the Samaritan did. You go and do the same as him. Be compassionate. Be, be sacrificial. Be proactive. Be broad in your understanding of neighbourliness. That's the spirit of God's law. Don't fall for a narrow interpretation of the letter of the law. But the conclusion the lawyer should have reached is this. What you're asking me to do, Jesus, is impossible. You have set the bar of God's law too high. I'll never attain it. I'll never love my neighbor in the way the Samaritan did. A few moments ago, I didn't even understand who my neighbour was. How then can I inherit, inherit eternal life when I have clearly failed to love my neighbour as myself? Concluding then that he could not inherit eternal life by his own efforts, he should have fallen at Jesus' feet and begged for mercy. He should have prostrated himself before Jesus and asked for forgiveness. He should have swallowed his pride and confessed his need of divine grace. He should have humbled himself before Jesus and said in repentance, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our verse for the week is this. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscience of our sin. Romans 3.20 And this was the Apostle Paul's inescapable conclusion. God's moral law is the yardstick we're judged by. And it serves to tell us that we've not lived up to its lofty standards. We have not loved God with all our being. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. Therefore, we all need grace. God's grace. And this should have been the conclusion the lawyer reached by the time his encounter with Jesus was over. Let me ask you this question this morning. Is this the conclusion you have come to not by the works of the law not by seeking to live a moral life not by loving your neighbor as yourself no loving your neighbor as yourself should be the christian's way of life but it is not the way to eternal life the way to eternal life is through christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead but a Samaritan. Does the parable of the Good Samaritan have a strong moral message? Of course it does. Does the parable of the Good Samaritan pack a powerful moral punch? Yes, of course it does. But the primary point of the parable is not ethical, but evangelistic. It exposes the lawyer's moral bankruptcy. It exposes ours. And like so many people today, we see the, the lawyer who sought to justify himself. We learn the story with the unexpected twist. We see Jesus asking the question the lawyer should have asked. We see the conclusion the lawyer should have reached. And in fact, the conclusion everyone should reach, not by the works of the law, but only by grace can you and I inherit eternal life. There is perhaps one further question we can ask of this passage. If this is how Jesus taught his disciples to love their neighbor as themselves, how well did Jesus practice what he preached? 
Well, actually, perfectly. We were not Jesus' neighbours. We were his enemies. But like the Samaritan in his incarnation, he came down to where we are. Like the Samaritan, he rescued us at his own expense. Like the Samaritan, he paid the down payment with his own life. And like the Samaritan, he promised to return and complete the rescue. Here's the last irony of the parable. Jesus is very much the epitome of the good Samaritan he calls his people to be. Amen.